welcome podcast listeners and viewers and thank you for joining us on the Lightwave Digest podcast episode 9. We are here to bring you all the news, reviews, interviews on everything Lightwave and beyond. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Hello, Andrew. Welcome back to another episode. H Hello. Hello. I should say that the the guest tonight is uh, Luke Whitehorn from um, Nymus 3D. So a returning guest, but this time it's him alone and we grill him. So don't miss that. Yes, we've grilled him thoroughly. Grilled him thoroughly, we have. <laughs> yeah. But what have you been up to? Uh, myself, just been busy. Um, I've had a bit of a bout of illness, but I'm on the re recovery, uh, which is not much fun for me. Uh, otherwise, just been busy at work, so I haven't had a lot of time to play with Lightwave, but I have had a little bit. Oh, nice, nice. I, uh, I hopefully I'm do I'm doing a project up and coming, which I was supposed to be doing like two weeks ago, but. I've yep. had about Vilnius. Uh, I'm going to be doing, I'm hoping to do, so I don't know whether I should even spoil it just in case it doesn't happen for a few months. I'm hoping to do like some guides on doing nodes uh, mm. for, for the Lightwave group just because um, I think we we'll lack the basics, don't we? And that was where I thought, you know, like how do you connect them up? How do you, what's, what's the point of them? Why would you not use, why would you use this over layers? Things like that. Um, so hopefully I can come up with good reasons. Oh yeah. Anyway, joining us, joining us, we have a special guest. Hello, Shabazi. Hello, guys. I'm back again. Uh, thank you for having me once again. Um, oh, I see sometimes feel like sometimes feel I should be taking up residency. <laughs> well, you're always welcome to come back if you if your if your workload um, gets less. You know. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yes, I've, I I will definitely do that. Um, if, when time allows, uh, I kind of miss you guys and I kind of miss the, the, the podcast getting involved in that. Uh, a lot of exciting things are happening here. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, yeah, let's just dive into that a little bit. As some people might have noticed in the last episode that there was a completely new look of the podcast. Uh, this new logo and everything looks, you know, much better and... and uh, yeah, and the reason that happened is because Shabasi was the one that he designed this stuff. So thank you so much for that, Shabasi. But I would want to get into a little bit about how how what was your thought process when you designed the logo. Um, uh, um, well, uh, to go back a bit with the origins of why we had to have a the logo done in the first place um i think was it mike wolf had it put was, together yes. a, mm, a logo yeah. for us initially yeah True. so uh back in in the olden days when we first started um we were kind of just really rushing to to get things done and we had a makeshift uh logo created thank uh, by uh, one of the other members of the team, which was Mike Wolf at the time, and he yeah. uh, used he came up with the logo that we had before, and it was lovely and everything. Um, we never but, had it in the podcast, though. We only had it on the server channel, I think. Yes, yeah. that's right. The I Discord think that's channel. Right, yeah. Yes, yeah. and I really we still liked hadn't it. Sort of, we still hadn't settled on it fully, but um, I did. I did like his little logo. It was quite nice. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was. It was a, it was a very nice logo. Um, the only thing was is that uh, when I was producer of the show, I had some concerns regarding the legal side of things with regards to copyright. Um, and I felt that um, to protect ourselves, we needed to have our own one uh, with the legal side of things covered as well. Now, even though Mike had said we were welcome to use his logo uh, without any uh, issues at all, um, it never hurts to cover yourself uh, from a legal standpoint. So I took some time out to to design a logo for uh, the podcast, um, which also included a license that uh, covered uh, its usage uh, by the podcast as well. Mm. Um, the 
doing that really afforded me the the the, the flexibility to go nuts basically <laughs> um <laughs> but primarily i'm i'm uh, an animator um but i also have modeling skills as well and the only thing is because i have a a bit of a um a more logical mindset than i do for a creative mindset um because i i i've this is a bit about my history going back to the early days of my computing experiences i learned to program on the commodore 64 and that switched on the logical brain side of my brain so a lot of my mindset is very to do with structure order logic rationality side of things which means the creative side of my mind which i have luckily been kind of suffered in the process so as i've gotten older the creative side of things became a bit more difficult for me um and i focused and it, so it took a bit more it was a bit more difficult for me to be able to come up with an idea for this logo so luckily we live in the future now and in the future we have uh, instant access to uh, inspiration sources so i went into the world of inspirational sources known as pinterest and had a look at some of uh, works from other people and gain some inspiration from them and i saw a few things that i like and decided to do a bit of a montage of different kind of uh, looks um i knew when i decided to to do the logo i had an idea that i wanted a monogram type of look but i also wanted it to be very very masculine so I used a lot of sharp edges and lots of uh, angles and, and straight lines, um, very little curvature. So I came up with a design to begin with, which had LD. And I did two different types of LD, uh, monogram type looks. Um, but I wanted to make sure that even though the, the lines were right, I wanted to know, I wanted to make sure that the, the look itself uh, from a surfacing standpoint, had that masculinity aspect to it. So I did a bit of research on on how to make on on how to make your your materials look more masculine, and came up with the metallic look. And I thought to myself, the metallic look would work on this. So lightweight, fortunately, is was since twenty well, generally speaking, but since lightweight twenty eighteen with the PBR materials, it's been dead easy to make materialistic um, uh, materials on, on services. So it was, it was just really a question of trying to emulate the right type of look, uh, right type of material applied to the right type of color scheme to make it really pop. And thanks to the inspirations that I saw, I, that pretty much made things a lot more easy. The only hard part was just coming up with the, the shape of the, the, let, the, the monogram in the first place. Once I got the shape of the monogram done, it was just really a case of just um, bringing it into, uh, re recreating it in Lightwave, knocking it up as a hard-based polygon model, and then um, bringing it into Lightwave, into layout, surfacing it, and lighting it properly putting it on the correct background and everything did that but then i had a thought i thought to myself this this logo looks so cool i really really love it i think this is really really i think the boys are going to really like this um i think i'm going to have massive pats on the back on this however there is just one thing that i have to consider now does it really reflect what the podcast is all about or is this more of a branding exercise for uh, the name Lightwave Digest? And I thought about it and I thought, you know what, it would be good to have something that reflected the, the podcast itself as being a podcast. So I, had a, I went back to my sources of insp inspiration and had a look at some of the, the ideas for podcast iconography. And I saw the most obvious thing, which is a microphone. Microphones are generally synonymous with podcasts in the podcast world. And I thought <laughs> to myself, I'll use that. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, for those who can't see, Andrew's pointed to his uh, his mic. <laughs> um, so I thought to myself, I'll do a very simple shape of a microphone, um, but I'll also incorporate the the lettering of LD in the in the shape of a microphone as well. And I thought about how we would do that. So I came up with a, a rough design for that. And I thought, oh, that, that really is quite nice. And kind of rinsed and repeated with this one, uh, using a metallic finish. Only this time it wasn't so angular, it wasn't so mas masculine because of the shape of the, the, the microphone itself. Um, it's more, it's got, it's, it's got curves in it. Um, but it, it still worked anyway, but it just looked more softer than the, the other one. And so once I'd done it, I presented it to the team to, to uh, get their approval on it. And I showed it first to, I think it was to, to Cageman and, and Sorn, because Andrew wasn't available to me. I, I called a meeting and Andrew wasn't available for it. And, and Cageman's reaction of it was... was <laughs> To the first one because I did it as a presentation slide and I kind of presented it first. Um, I did the the masculine logo, and Cage Run's reaction to that was he went absolutely nuts over it. He, <laughs> he he just said, "I want this. I love this. This is one. I want this. This is it. I absolutely love this." And I thought to myself, "Does he really like it?" It would kind of indicate that he does, but I'm not absolutely sure. <laughs> But he, he he indicated that he really liked it, and and Sorn um, also uh, said that he loved it as well. And this is okay. So I showed them the next one, the microphone shaped one, and they were very very enthusiastic about that as well. But their heart was really going towards the 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 the, the more masculine um, uh, monogram type, and. I said, okay. And we had a conversation about that. And it seemed like the the one that they were going to go for was the, the monogram type. So I thought, okay, well, let me call a meeting with Andrew and I'll get Andrew's input on it. Oh, yeah. The thing about Andrew is that Andrew takes a very different approach to his enthusiasm levels. Andrew is very... Um, Preserved in his enthusiasm. I'm British. I'm British. <laughs> yes, but you're northern. <laughs> That's true. That's Which true. means that you have you have more more spirited outlook than us southerners. I think I'm more blunt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so Andrew had a look at it, and Andrew had a very looked at it from a very critical standpoint and i like that because i come from the same school of thought as, as andrew i take a very analytical and, and critical view of things um it's not that we're looking for flaws or anything like that but we 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 know what works and we know what doesn't so andrew pointed out some of um, some shortcomings in in it um and i asked him which one he liked most and he said he liked them both if i remember correctly um, but he he felt that if he had to choose between them, the one he would go for was the microphone one, simply because it reflected more to do with the podcast being a podcast than the monogram type. And I thought the same thing, which was the reason why I created it in the first place. So I thanked him for his input on that one, and he gave me some tips on on other things that needed to be updated as well um on that which unfortunately i don't think i actually got around to to doing um but suffice it to say anyway um after doing all of that um i decided to to call a vote on the uh which one to choose and i said to the boys i said to them that i couldn't actually vote on this simply because i was too close to it and i couldn't be impartial so i leave it to you guys um so they I gave them a deadline to cast their vote and I thought to myself, I don't really know why I'm asking them to vote on this. It's just really a formality because I know which one they're going to go for. They're going to go for the monogram type. 
Um, because <laughs> if, if you know everybody likes the monogram type, uh, with the exception of possible, well, Andrew likes it, but Andrew's made his his choice, so he's going to get outvoted anyway. Um, so come the day of the the results of the vote, it turns out all three of them decided to go for the microphone type. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, what in holy hell went wrong there? What happened here? I, I did not see that one coming at all. That's why you so, should never trust opinion polls, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> in the privacy of my own home, I can vote secretly for the one I really like. <laughs> <laughs> and so to this vote... day, we don't know who was the one who voted for it. Oh, wait, we do. Yeah, um... <laughs> yeah now we do. It's all come out. <laughs> So all three of them voted for the the uh, the iconic uh, iconic graphic type, the the microphone, and that became the official logo for it. And the reason behind that was basically because they felt that, or you guys felt that, uh, uh, it reflected more to do with the podcast being a podcast. Now I don't know if you guys had a meeting um, behind the scenes to discuss it. Or no, if it was not, just something really. that was by pure pure fluke that everybody just happened to coincide with this, coming to the same conclusion or not. Um, well, I think to be, to be I honest, think... to be honest, I actually voted. I think I voted for the the more masculine thing because uh, mm. it was the more monogram. metal. Uh, as I, I, I'm a metal head, right? So the hard rock <laughs> and you know that stuff because it had that vibe to it. But then I think I think it was Sorn that actually turned uh, around and actually voted for the mic. So it was two against one. So Sorn and uh, Andrew voted for the microphone and I voted mm. for the, the metal version. Uh, and um, at the end, we talked about, I think we talked a little bit about it. And then I said, okay, let's go for the microphone uh, logo. So you, you, just, you just caved in basically. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> two against one. I don't have a chance, right? <laughs> or pretty much. <laughs> so th th that's how that came about with, with regards to how um, the the logo came together. And you also helped out with um, the the new thing. You know, now we have sort of a a frame, and then we have where the logo it, where the logo is right now. That changes into the b-roll stuff or if we have cameras uh, you know and you helped also design that frame as well so oh, to, yes, to, to, yes. to the right we have at the top we have the hosts and then uh, then we have the guests and you made animation for it as well and uh, yes so, yeah. that 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 one um to to give a bit of background on that one i for those who don't know, I've, I, I'm no longer part of the, the podcast anymore, um, uh, simply because I've, I've uh, had uh, other work that needed to, to be uh, attended to. Um, so unfortunately, I had to drop out because of time restrictions. Yeah. Um, but I got a contact, but Caterman contacted me to um, have a look at uh, the, a new design that he had for the f format for the show, for the, the, the layout and format of the, the sh uh, show design. And as soon as I saw his design, I thought, sort of, I know exactly how I'm going to make this. I know exactly how I'm going to update this. I think I asked Cageman what was um, Andrew's uh, thoughts on Cageman's de design. And I think Cageman said that there was some changes that needed to be made in Andrew's mind. And I thought to myself, I think I know exactly what Andrew's talking about. So I thought to myself, because I had already done the look for uh, the the show uh, when I was part of it, because to give people a bit more background, the logo wasn't the only thing that I actually um, designed. I expanded that to uh, the whole look of the show itself. So the whole show itself had uh, a new color scheme, uh, new fonts, uh, new layouts, lower thirds, and everything. So the, the, the design went beyond just the logo. And I thought, mm, I know yeah. exactly how I'm going to change uh, Cageman's pres presentation to me. 
So I kind of took some of the old designs uh, or the original designs that I did for the layout every, of everything and put replaced the background that Cageman had, replaced the um, the fonts that he had for his one, for his layout, and decided that what I wanted to do was have some animation added to it as well. So I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do some anim animation, it's going to be not only on the re reduction of the logo from f full screen down to a smaller uh, amount, I'm also going to animate the text as well. So I thought, which text am I going to to animate? And I thought, well, I'm, what would be good was to would be to animate the the words guest and the words host, because yeah. those will be the only things that will effectively be the same every single episode. The words guest and host, whereas with the 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 host themselves and the guests themselves, that will change. So that's something mm. that can be hand, be handled by Cageman, but as a standard thing, just change the the words guest and host. So I decided that I was going to use Lightwave 2023 to do this because Lightwave 2023 has a new text tool in layout that allows you to do um, animations as well without having to jump back and forth between modular. I thought I'd try it out. So did a bit of swatting up, read the, the documentation that Ben Foss had put online, learned how to do it, and tentatively tried out applying bones to the... The, the text themselves, not really thinking that the bones thing was going to work. I thought it was going to probably break it. Lo and behold, rock solid. Out of the box, boom. Nice. Apply bones, no problems at all, ready for animating. I thought it literally blew my mind how easy it was. No manually creating bones or anything. Just straight out of the box, just one button press and you're good to go. It just saves so much time doing that. Yep. So the only problem with the, the whole thing was, the text tool it was, is that unfortunately one of the letters, I think it was the O, um, has a polygon issue and it's a type it's a it's a font issue. So oh, instead oh, of yeah. having instead of having an O with a, a hole in the middle, it was just like a, a disc. Mm. And I had to manually go into modular to create the use use the modular text tool to create the O, oh, bring that into into layout and just manually put everything in place. But once that was done, um and that's that to to be fair, that's nothing to do with Lightwave. It's nothing, it's just to do with the way that the font the font that I had uh and how Lightwave uh, uh renders it. Um but once it was done anyway I decided to to do the animations for each letter and turn them one by set the lighting up um and render them out and put them in into a co the final composition in that I used in TV paint and it worked absolutely look absolutely beautiful absolutely beautiful and once it was done I gave the files over to to Cageman to have a look at it and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. I know that Cageman gave didn't when he contacted me, we didn't have a lot of time to to get this done. Um, because I think Cageman needed it done pretty darn quickly. Yeah, um, yeah true. And so having that text tool really did make uh, make life a lot more easy just to get things um out the out the gates really quickly. So that really was a, a bit of a godsend <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, managed to get it done, get it sent to him. Shall we move on to the news guys? Let's do news. There have been some really cool stuff going on in the Lightwave land lately. Um there have been a shed load of new tutorials uploaded to the Lightwave Digital or Lightwave 3D YouTube channel. It's it's uh, I think it's a mix of t t Tony Hall, um, Mark Warner, and uh, Kelly Myers. Yes. Uh, and Kelly Myers, I think he is mostly working with things like Octane and maybe I, I do know the, the fact that he has done a bunch of tutorials for Turbulence FD. Mm. 
Yeah, I think Kelly's quite an expert on turbulence. Um, he's used that a lot, so there's some really good advice in that. Uh, the Mark 101s that I've seen are fantastic. Um, great motion graphics stuff, which is something we don't see an awful lot of in, in Lightwave land, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the text tool will probably be handy for him as well. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> given that it worked. Uh, <laughs> um, but he does all sorts of really cool stuff, and some of his little demos are really easy to follow along, and great information um so yeah this I've, I've only seen a few of them but they're really good so far yep have you yeah. seen any of them shabazi i've seen some uh done by uh anthony hall uh mm. he's been quite busy as well uh normally when i look at anthony hall's work it's really quite short form um his his videos very rarely seem to go or the ones i've seen very rarely seem to go beyond maybe three or four minutes and um, they're quite short uh, however this particular time he seems to be putting a lot of effort into some of the the videos and he's put they they've going on for quite some duration that's quite some depth um which is great uh, for people who really want to delve into to lightwave and uh, the stuff that he's coming out with are very eye opening. I'm even learning some new stuff. I didn't even know that Anthony knew as much as he did. At least mm. he does rather. He knows he's very knowledgeable in this stuff. Um, mm, yeah. So I have been very impressed with with his uh, his output so far. The the sheer volume of tutorials that I've, they've launched. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen that that much uploaded at any one time from Lightwave at all. Um, they've already been, always been somewhat piecemeal, but this is like a, a huge dump of, of great stuff that's been put out there. So hopefully there's something there for everybody. Oh, yeah, know, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, hopefully more coming soon because they, well, the, you know, that, that, they're trying to get more, you know, better guides, better manuals, better, you know, but to, to help drag people back into Lightwave to show the power of Lightwave, really. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, on, on, on that note, though, uh, uh, a, a bit of an update uh, with regards to the tutorial side of things. Uh, ben Voss has put together a bit of a project to have a beginner's guide to Lightwave. And mm -hmm. he's recruiting people from the community to get involved in this. And uh, it's early stages at the moment. And the mindset of it is it's really to be a very, uh, and this is showing my age, a uh, very Peter and Jane type of approach to it. For those people who don't know what Peter and Jane is, it's uh, a very, very elementary, basic child's entry into reading. Um, and it's he's taking a similar approach for uh, novices, A, about Lightwave, B, about um, 3D in general, who have absolute people who have absolutely no clue, who've never really got into this side of things at all. So it's not for advanced users or inter intermediate users. It's really is for your hardcore novice um, to break you in gently. And uh, he's engaging pe with people from the community to get involved in now. And, and uh, I I will be doing what I can to to help out on that as, as well, simply because I am a lightweight lightweight patriot, and it's mm. my duty. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of people in the community are going to be starting to helping out with these things, and um, I think the problem with one of the things with Lightwave is it is um, there's a lot of old dogs uh, in Lightwave, and they've either figured it out themselves or just you know gotten their way through, and um, it is a little. It's not you know the thing about one of the. I don't know. I'm jumping about here. One of the brilliant things about Lightwave is to do the basic things. It's actually really simple. Uh, and I think that helps it, but it we could have more of a guide to how to do some of the more basic things in Lightwave. Um, because if you're completely new to 3D, you haven't got a clue. We obviously all know how to do all the basics. Um, albeit, sometimes I still learn things from other people. Uh, and of course, there's always the, oh, I've never used that bit of Lightwave. Um, <laughs> I still it's haven't true. got it's, much of a clue for, for doing it's... animations involving bones and things like that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but it's very true. I mean, I, I've been using Lightwave since the 1990s, and I'd like to think that I've got some experience with it. But even I'm still learning stuff, new stuff about it that I I 
didn't know it could do, but it can do. Mm. Um, the only thing I'd probably say that, unfortunately, officially, that I think that I wish was better was the the learning path to Lightwave. I think right now, learning how to use Lightwave is very much a piecemeal if you don't if you want to do it for free. If you don't want to put mm. your hand in your pocket and buy the books or buy training material that gives you a, a structured course on how to do things from beginning through to end and you just want to learn it for free, it's it's very chaotic and how you actually know mm, where to really. start, where to go to the next stage and how to progress to the next thing. It's, you, you, it's very easy to, to get a very mixed up way of, of unjoined thinking. And... This new project by by Ben aims to fix that. Lightway Digital uh, had a showcasing where they showcased the uh, Unreal Bridge, the real-time yes. Unreal Bridge, which I was like, oh my god, this is so good, because you can even shade the objects inside of Lightwave and it updates inside of Unreal in real time. It's amazing. I have played around with it, by the way. So have you mm. guys had, had a chance to play around with it? I haven't had a chance yet, but I watched some of the uh, the, the video. Sadly, I couldn't make the live event, which I was a bit sad about. Uh, but yes, um, having seen some of the previews to it and seen um, the things that it's capable of, it looks really good. Um, I think the most impressive thing about it is actually is it's bi-directional as well. Oh, yeah, that's true. So update an animation inside of Unreal, you can actually send that animation back. So they are both in sync, uh, the Lightwave scene file and the project in Unreal. Um, what were your impressions of it, Shabazi? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, with regards to that, I'm going to give a bit of a, a, a disclaimer on this one. Um, full disclosure, as I said to you before, I'm, I'm a, a vanilla Lightwave user, which basically includes me not using any other 3D apps at all. Lightwave is the only app I, I use for, for 3D works. Um, so I saw the Unreal demo, and the only reason re I watched it was simply because it's related to, to Lightwave. Um, but I've never used Unreal. I have absolutely zero knowledge of how it works. So me watching the the presentation and seeing everybody gasping at how cool it is was completely lost on me because <laughs> I had no frame of reference as to yeah. why it was cool. <laughs> um, so I'm just as, I'm pretty much just assuming that it's cool and it's an amazing thing and that they've done great work. Um, I, I think the main reason for that was it's the, it's the real time way that is bridged rather than import and exporting, um, and also as everybody knows who has ever used Lightwave, especially getting files in and out of Lightwave is a lot more of a hassle than it really should be. Right. Um, I think if you only work in Lightwave, it's fine. Mm. Um, but I think it's like things like FBX can be very flaky. You try and import it from other third party programs because, you know, not everything's made in Lightwave. Uh, mm. You want you want an asset from a third party and it comes in upside down and all the limbs are stretched and all the bones are pointing the wrong way or something like that. It can be an absolute nightmare. And yeah. the way in which it's just able to take a rigged model and put it straight into Unreal seamlessly without actually you doing any hard work or at all. And you can, you know, pose it, rig it, move all of the parts in Unreal, and then that comes back to Lightwave. That's just amazing. Yeah, but but yeah, on, on the note of, of Unreal Bridge, uh, one of the things that I think this will open up for a lot of people is the fact that they actually have now access to a, a real-time render engine. Mm -hmm. Um because from my understanding is that there are a lot of architectural visualization places right now that are essentially using Unreal for something that actually, or it, it looks almost as good as a, like a proper ray traced GI interior stuff. It's very, very close to, to being, uh, you know, 
can compete in certain areas with, with regular render engines. Um, so I think that, you know... Oh, also as well, you, it, it's interactive. So if you were showing this to a client, you can walk them around. Oh yeah, true, true. It, 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 in a, you know, you've got you've built a you know virtual reality version, and you can control it like a game because it is a game engine, fundamentally. Um, and they're very close to not the certain situations where it won't look realistic, but it's very good and very close to. Yeah, I, th um, I think I think that's something that I I did even though I I'm very much a, a spoiled brat. Um, I. I have to admit, I did take that on board when I saw that. When I watched the presentation, I saw Unreal um, rendering the, the image almost instantaneously. And then you saw VPR um, taking its time to catch to do its rendering. And then you saw um, uh, Octane uh, mm. doing what it did, taking its time to, to render, even though it's a GPU. And because in the presentation, they had all three running at the same time. Yes. And I... Yeah. I I, I was pretty blown away by how responsive Unreal was when it came to the renders. It was just like, it was almost as though it was like, it was pre-rendered. It was yeah. so, it was, it was so good. Yeah. Let's move on to the interview now. And again, it's going to be with Luke Whitehorn from Nymus 3D. And again, he is a returning guest, but now he's speaking on his own. Enjoy. Enjoy. Enjoy, everyone. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's guest. He vroomed the architectural industry with a plugin. He has since then worked on everything from sci-fi to subatomic worlds. Welcome, Luke. Hello. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Hello. I'm so doing pretty well. I've got my tea. Well, what's left of it? <laughs> Even some chocolate. How very British of you. So um... I seriously like. I, I can't. I can't do without it. I take it to work with me and everything. Like milk and everything. I have to build my own tea at work. It's the only way I can function. <laughs> do, they, do they have that? Um, stupid question. I mean, obviously they'll have tea, but do they have that kind of? Mm. You know, like British can be really fussy about the tea when they like the tea. Do that. Do they? Well, they have tea uh, this is very important for the podcast as well like tea. it's very important listeners. we need to know all the secrets this is at the top of the show this is the most important thing that's the tea situation but yeah they game. have they have tea over here but like they i have to use two tea bags and it's still pathetically weak so oh no because they're used to tea without milk in it so if you have tea if you have like our tea without milk in it it's really really bitter and you put the milk in it and it's just a nice thing Whereas over here, they just do uh, tea without milk in it. So they're like, oh, yeah. it's got to be like slightly brown water that doesn't <laughs> taste of anything at all. It's just no good. It's no good. Step it up, Netherlands. Rubbish. Do you need me to send you like an emergency supplies or something? <laughs> no, I, every time I go to the UK, I buy a, several box loads of Yorkshire tea. <laughs> Take it back with me. It keeps me going. It's the only way. Um, it's, anyway, it, it's a little, it's a little overshare, but I just, I just, there's a really funny thing happened when I went to the expo, and I haven't mentioned it, but um, but Ben doesn't get to the UK very often, so he asked uh, Andy mm. to bring him uh, several boxes of Tunnock's tea cakes because he can't get those in France, and on the way there, Andy partly sat on them, and so they're a bit squashed. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so we we was like, oh well, you can have some because obviously they'll be a bit squashed and sat on. So I'm like, I'll eat them. <laughs> <laughs> All Which ends up the same way, is the same. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> anyway, let's get on with 3D stuff. Well, I, I, yeah. I, 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 what I, are we I, talking about? Well, I, I, just, I don't uh, know. Well, reg Light regarding wave, maybe <laughs> regarding uh, tea. Uh, I, I, it was a tea, <laughs> sir. Okay, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, man, uh, uh, but, uh, just for transparency, I, I should, we should mention that Luke uh, worked uh, with me uh, way, way back. Um, actually, mm -hmm. I think it was, was it 
six years ago or something, eight years maybe? No, no, not that long. No, it was it was a lot longer. It was a lot longer. It was like thirteen years ago, I think. Ah, that's that's yeah. But you, you were with us. I've been for... here for ten years. Yeah, and yeah. I was with you like maybe I don't know, just a couple of years before that. I don't know. I don't know how time works. It's all just a mush <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> yeah, but I just want to make sure that everyone. Is, is, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm trans transparent with the fact that that you and I have worked together before. Uh, so, yes. So, so, so when you throw me all these softballs, <laughs> as they say, people will know why you're being so kind nice. to me. We don't we don't ask hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> is that what this is? It's going to be a combative interview. <laughs> no, but but uh, I want the, the usual question, of course, is. You know, I mean, you have been using Lightwave for ma many years, and you have also been a developer mm -hmm. of Lightwave plugins uh, as well. Uh, and one of them yes. that I mentioned was VRoom, which I think when that came out, I, I think that the because the architectural visualization, visualization studios at that time were mostly 3D Studio Max. And VRoom actually mm -hmm. changed a lot of, and I, I know that people were like, holy mother, I want that plugin for 3D Studio Max, you know. Um, but but yeah. before we go into that stuff uh, and your career and all that, and all that um, can you take us back to the young Luke when you, <laughs> hopefully you, you weren't born on a desert planet, right? <laughs> okay. Sorry, <laughs> but but uh, you, are actually, you, are actually, you are actually born in, in the UK, right? Correct, uh, yes. And UK is very famous for their own computers like the Amstrad and, and Acorn, for example. Um, mm -hmm. But what was the first computer experience that you had uh, growing up? Oh, wow. Now you're putting me on the spot. Well, like... I was a poor boy from a poor family. Well, and I, one of my friends got a PC, and so I just I desperately wanted a PC. Um, although I think, I think I had a Commodore. I can't remember. It's it's all kind of a blur. But like I remember there being a paint program on this Commodore, and I had like a a dot matrix printer that never worked properly. But I remember being like <laughs> one of the first ones in my class to uh, hand in something on a typed, typed and printed out thing. Everyone else hand wrote everything. I typed mine and handed it in. It was blue though, because <laughs> the damn thing never worked correctly. Um, yeah. And they had the Amiga and we used to, me and my friend used to go down to the market on a Sunday um to buy games like i'm so naive i was even more naive and uh i just you know guys selling games i just buy he sells games i buy games blah that was it like now looking back the guy was obviously a criminal <laughs> like <laughs> he, he used to ask he's one of those people who smoke cigarettes like a fisherman like what do you want what do you want mate <laughs> and i used to ask him like one week and be like i want that game i want walker by cygnosis if you got oh, walker yeah. look come back next week mate and he'd have it next week two pounds and then i'd go home <laughs> and play it that game was so good and yeah. so violent and great i loved it that said that said many moons ago that was a lot of money it's you know, special to me. I worked like, like you know, 10 years down the coal mines to, to get two pounds, you know. You say, you laugh, <laughs> but like th with that same friend, I also worked like fruit picking. And I remember like in a p and picking uh, blackberries and getting like your hands stabbed to death by the bushes or like picking strawberries and having your knees be red raw from like crawling along on the straw on the floor and like working just an incredibly what felt like an incredible amount just slaving away and sweating and like we'd always look over at these like other groups of ladies who were just chatting away just like seemingly like barely moving and like they'd somehow earn like two or three times the amount that we did 
I don't know how they did it, but it was bad. <laughs> it was it was a hard time. That's all I can say. But um, that was one of my first first experiences with computers. I think it was the good old Amiga. Well, I didn't have one of those for too long. I think it just kind of broke in the end. But um, in the end, I got a PC as well, and I always used to walk home um, via this. And there was a PC shop on the way home. And these poor people who ran the shop, like they must have hated me, because uh, <laughs> I used to go into the shop, and they had a PC, and it was demoing Wing Commander Two, and mm. it blew my fucking mind. This thing, and like I just wanted to play this game nonstop all the time, and that was my goal in life for like a year was to be able to afford a PC, and play Wing Commander. It's all I wanted to do in my life because I was super into sci-fi and I just wanted to I wanted some escapism, wanted to be be in there. And it was actually Wing Commander 3 that I was aiming for. And I eventually got a PC for many, many hundreds of pounds. It's like eight hundred pounds, I think. It was like the lowest spec that would play that game. I think mm. I had four megabytes of RAM, but you needed eight. So I had to go up to London one day and pay 80, 80 or 100 pounds to get another four meg of RAM. And this, is, this was thing was the key. It was going to let me play Wing Commander 3 at one frame a second, if that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I loved it. I yeah. loved it. It was so, it was amazing, that game. And uh, yeah, Chris Roberts, good job on that one. So... You you came into into the PC with with the games sort of like the Wing Commander sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, when when did you when did you encounter 3D the first time and sort of like oh this is interesting? Well, it's actually a friend of mine. I think at university he had a copy of Lightwave Five somehow. Um, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Yeah, somehow. Just we all, we all had a friend like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh I remember like it it came with a spaceship model, I think, that thing. Uh, and is he, that, li is that little like <laughs> sort of point triangular triangle shape shape. Yeah, 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 I yeah, yeah. That. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And what he did was he, he showed me this stuff and I was just like again, I was blown away by this because it's hard for bit because Blender like is just you know you could just go oh, I'll just grab Blender and see all the stuff it can do. But at the, that time, like these tools were just like you just didn't have access to this stuff. You couldn't do this stuff. That was mm. for like it just appeared on TV, and that was that. Yep. And now to be like wow, I have the tool in front of me, and what he did is he got the ship, he jittered it, made a morph, and then just uh, I think he put a lens flare on, so it was like a ship exploding. It was like the size of rendering at the size of a postage stamp and like one second oh, yeah. of footage. And it took like an hour or two to render. So we went off and then came back That's and quite saw that thing. Me, and I was just like, <laughs> yeah, maybe it was a lot longer. But uh, I was just amazed by it. And again, like it's, it's difficult for people now to appreciate that like you've just been given a tool. You have in your hands a tool that like you, that, was just completely out of reach before. Um, yeah, it's a difficult thing for people to appreciate now that, like, I th can't remember if, when when would that have been? That would have been, it must have been at the time, like, Babylon 5 was out, because I remember watching Babylon 5 yeah. at university. Mm -hmm. So, like, I saw this stuff on TV, and I didn't actually know at the time that Lightwave was the thing that was responsible for Babylon 5's visual effects. Um I, all I knew is like, wow, I could just do something. And I think like at some point I made the Titanic in it really badly. Like, because we didn't, the internet was barely starting. Mm. So there was no like sites to just tell you how to do any of this stuff. Like yeah. there was no manual, obviously, because it was a a copy that was acquired somehow. Um, yeah, but even then, even the, the, a lot of the manuals was kind of like, you know, this is function A, 
A does function A, and you're like, right, that didn't tell me how it works, really. It's like, <laughs> yeah, the art, the art of documentation was not uh, as good as it is nowadays. Yeah, but, we did um, examples and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I hadn't. You just had no idea what any of this. You just had to try random things. I do remember when when I first used Lightwave for the first time. It was sort of like. Imagine worked like what modern ray tracers do, where it just sort of rendered line by line by line like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Lightweight was like drew polygons on the screen. I'm like, what is going on? It was oh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it rendered like I that. And it was like, what, what is this? What? Because it's weird. That's like how everybody does rendering now. And how Lightwave's done it for years. It's just, but back in the day when I, I, I you know, used some really old copies of it, and it was yeah, it sort of did it like polygon by polygon because it was yeah. a lot more of a hybrid yeah. back then. Yeah, but that that's actually uh, interesting because I I do remember, you know, even back in Lightwave seven or eight, it still had that sort of rendering system. Mm. And I do mm. remember, you know, e even the Maya guys were like. Uh, you know, it, it's fun watching Lightwave render. You know, it, it's fun <laughs> watching that progress going on. Uh, while in Maya, it was just a dot 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 dot, yeah. <laughs> or maybe buckets or something like that. You know, with, mm. with more, more like if you use, uh, let's say, uh, Render Man or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it, it's um, yeah, it was How fun far times. We've come. Fun times. <laughs> it was, yeah, and I just remember like not having a manual or anything like that mm, yeah and but you just had the desire to like i'm just gonna spend all night <laughs> just fucking with stuff and just seeing what happens yeah and yeah it was just fun just that endless like enthusiasm to just experiment and just yeah it was a really really exciting time you found out light wave you got a a, a copy of it so to speak and uh you figured things out how how old were you at that time christ now you're asking um well i went to university there when i was 19 i must have been like 19 20 mm. something yep. like that but yep. like that's when i was first introduced to it and that but there was a long period of time after that where i just i didn't use it at all i just didn't have access to it because i only had access to it those few years at uni and it was something i tinkered with but I was doing a degree in physics, so sort of going in that direction. Um, and then uh, eventually decided to change careers from what I was doing. And because um, I picked it up, I got eventually got a job and I sort of ended up picking it up again in that job and just tinkering with it there for use in presentations and stuff like that. And um, I just... I just kept being like drawn to doing that stuff and like i just really wanted to do that stuff more than anything else <laughs> so at some point i decided to be like okay i'll just try and make this my career somehow <laughs> having no clue what i was doing whatsoever it's a miracle i'm still actually employed doing this stuff because by all means like i shouldn't have I this think so. I think so. If people did, because basically, you, you, as you say, we no one knew what they were doing. We were all scratching mm. around together <laughs> in a way, and you didn't have like forums were hardly a thing back back that far. No, no, no. Uh, or if they did, yeah. they were like terrifying places. Like, oh no, you know, it took me a while to get into forums. I didn't have reliable internet until you know in my mid twenties or something. Yeah, uh, I think know, there was this awful famous... Has Ben has Ben told you the stories about me? Ben, not he yet. Yeah, he must know because he, he used to. No, he used to work at New Tech in France, didn't he? Because he, obviously, oh yeah, New yeah, yeah. Europe, yeah. French, yes, he did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So because of where I was working, don't know if you need to cut this out or not, but um, I there was no real internet access. I'm not even sure if there was forums or anything like that. But like we we bought a legit copy, so we had technical support. I used to just call Ben. <laughs> just <be> like <laughs> i can't do something how do i do it like i just can't figure it out <laughs> please help me but i always used to like just call up the the new tech office in france and then the first thing i would say is do you speak english in french of course 
<laughs> or just ask for Ben at some points. And uh, yeah, that poor guy, I must have been bothering him the whole time. Well, a lot. <laughs> He, he hasn't mentioned. Yeah. It's weird, actually. I met Ben for the first time um, quite a few years ago, but it was so surreal meeting him because I'm sure, like yourself, Luke, I, I used to, mm. every like you know month when it came out, things like Amiga Format, 3D mm. uh, World, stuff like that, and Ben was the editor on Amiga Format, and then he went on to do... Um, I remember what, reading the, the, uh, the Lightwave tutorials written by Ben. Yeah. Wow. And it's just like so yeah, surreal. Like, like yeah. a celebrity. And then you meet yeah. him and it's like, oh, you're a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can attest to that. I mean, Amiga format uh, was a big thing for me, especially the, the CD ROM thing in, in Sweden. Yeah, well, but because it, it was, was the absolute lifeline, it had everything on all these little demo yeah. scenes and. Uh, really cool, you know, all of, you know, and you got like cool pieces of software on it and stuff like that. And you're like, oh my God. And you would try and adapt however it worked into your workflow because it, you couldn't just go and download things, could you, back then? No. Mm. Yeah, yeah, cover discs. Yeah, cover, cover discs. discs and like, even yeah. cover CD ROMs uh, as well. I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's why, that's, that's how I actually ended up with Octomid Sound Studio because it was the free version of Octomid Sound Studio that was bundled. With Amiga format, uh, so yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean... got I got on them. Um, I can't remember what magazine. I think it was PC format. I got the f the full copy of Imagine, and so mm. during my my degree, I did three D by they had like a PC lab in the, in the art building they didn't use hardly ever, and so I just it, it only ran in DOS mode. So I would just like do my rendering at night and turn <laughs> every bit into DOS, load up uh, <laughs> that. <and do> it. <laughs> anyway, it's not talking about me, but uh, yeah, it's funny all these little, weird little things us ma mega nerds used to do. Yeah. Um, to, to sort of like try and figure this stuff out and sneak in the back door. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Did I ever tell you about my um, the, the, the most overpriced and underpowered render farm that I ever set up using ScreenNet? <laughs> Did I tell you about that? No. I don't no, think so. No, tell go, us about go for it. it. Well, this, is what, I, this is what we're here when for. When I was working as a, as a physicist, um, like I said, I was, we just had Lightwave just so I could do like some diagrams or animations of how things work to, um, to show to other departments. Um, but I needed um, I needed an animation rendered, uh, but we didn't have like loads of PCs lying around. But we did just we had bought a batch of oscilloscopes. I think these things were about seventy k each or something. But they were essentially a PC with a touch screen, just a really low powered PC for seventy grand. <laughs> I think we had 12 of the things, but I managed to get them all wired up and running Scream in it. <laughs> I, was, I think I was rendering F prime or LWSN on, on these oscilloscopes and it made things slightly faster to render. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as well, it's just a challenge to get Scream in it working at all. Like it's like, well, these things are computers technically, so I'll just use them just to, I just want it working at this point. I don't even care how much faster it is. That thing was a that thing was hell to get set up. You get you get into Lightwave, and where did mm -hmm. you start coding? Because some of your bigger things uh, that I think you're remembered for are things like V Room and and other and ch uh, chain uh, what is called Chain Link Chain Move. Ch uh, chain Move, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, those like. Well, I think I, I started like tinkering with code again at university. Again, I was introduced to it by a friend. And I don't know, it's just one of those subjects that like you just gravitated towards. Like we didn't really do much coding at university. I think we did like one Fortran course and that was it. But um, my friend showed me C++ and I just played around with it. And like I'd made just like out of interest just like tried to get it to do stuff i kind of i just found the idea appealing that like wow you can if you have the knowledge you can kind of make anything that runs on a computer again like being having that barrier broken down of like now you can be the one who can do this stuff that you were just consuming before 
I found that really, really appealing. And I remember I used to play um, uh, Total War games, mm -hmm. the uh, Shogun Total War or Medieval Medieval Total War, love that thing. And I just I remember like I wanted larger unit sizes or something, <laughs> so I made some tool in in C plus plus using Microsoft Foundation classes or something just to make an interface to edit files that would oh. make the units all max out in size like. <laughs> um, yeah, and I just I used to just make tools to do stuff that I I wanted. Like I used to I worked at a cinema as well, and I've always I've always been a bit like automation inclined, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Like I used to work at, at a cinema as a stock controller. Uh, that's a person who like deals with um, like how much food there is, uh, how much how many toys, mainly food though, um, stuff to sell to people. So, and there was a certain procedure that you had to go through in order to order food. You need to see like how much you got in stock according to the computer, how much you need, you would sell over a two week period of similar intensity, take one from the other. That's how much you got to order all simple stuff. And people used to do that manually every week. And it used to take oh. a long ass time because you have to look up a report, print it out, do numbers calculations manually and the whole thing was run the, the the entire place was run by a database that was written in Microsoft Access so I learned how to do use Microsoft Access and found that I could just get the information out of the database it was sitting right there so I did that learned some VBA coding to do that stuff so I got something that, that would take like I don't know four or five hours four hours of labor of calculations that would be error prone and I got it down to uh, the computer would just do it in like 30 seconds or so which is nice and I start I just started writing tools to do stuff that like I didn't want to do um I've kind of always been that way I suppose so like I just I just like coding it's just I find it like kind of creative as well it's both creative and useful and I think I, I remember I went to a Lightwave meetup and then I think it was the first one I ever, ever went to because I, I drove from work and I had to, I used to travel back to Kent um, on, on the weekends because I lived in Berkshire and then traveled back to Kent. So I, on this occasion, like there was a Lightwave meetup, it was in central London. So I drove to central London, no GPS, no nothing, had to use a paper map to find out where the hell I was going. <laughs> on my own in central London. That was not fun. Um, but yeah, managed to park up, go there, have a, have a meeting. And I remember speaking to uh, Jeremy Hardin. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Hmm. The, uh, and, uh, uh, the, 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 um, instancing guy, isn't he? The, uh, no, no, he did. He did, uh, IDOF, I think. And, yeah. Yes. Um, and reference the, motion. Uh, the, the, Passes, passes, the uh, passes system, passport. That's the passport. one. And also oh, he had, also, uh, had a motion modifier that actually could reference uh, motion files as well. Yeah, mm. he, he built a whole bunch of stuff and he started uh, asking me about like how to implement some paper that he referenced. So I, it was about how to do um, depth of field. I think it was, maybe that was the one that, Resulted in IDOF. I can't remember. Well, yeah, well, it probably blow. was, wasn't it? Yeah, IDOF. No. Yeah, but it was it was a paper that did. It took like the a physics based um, equation about diffusion, and then applied that to an image. But you diffused based on different amounts based on the depth, and stuff like that. So I, I helped him uh, implement that. Um, wow! But he's he's a smart cookie. He's smarter than me. He could have done it. So he didn't really need my help, I don't think. Sometimes, but yeah, that introduced that's... me to L script. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go on, Andrew. No, I was just going to say sometimes you need that the to bounce ideas off people to go. Well, why don't you do it this way? And you're like, oh, mm. oh, hang on, actually, no, that's wrong. But <laughs> it's yeah. given me this like idea, like you can go around the houses and come up with a, a different way of doing it, which works better or faster or. Yeah, I think at the time as well. This this. This makes me sound so dumb, but like I, I don't think I knew L script existed. Like mm. I was 
still fairly new to it. Like I hadn't actually had that much experience in Lightwave. Like I'd done some some stuff, but like it's just the surface level stuff, the, the basic animations and things like that. Never really dove into it, and I'd never like. I hadn't had any other experience of applications that could, that have scripting systems, so I didn't even really know it was a thing. So Jeremy showed, said like, "Oh, you got L script, and you can do all this stuff." And I think I got like managed to get like L script manuals or some sort of documentation was available then. And again, I was just like, "Wow, this is great!" Again, I've got I can do even more stuff. So I I got into the L scripting side of things and. From then, I went a bit further and got into the SDK. Um, but I couldn't have done that without Mike Wolf's help. Um, mm, yeah, the C++ wrapper absolute, he wrote, didn't he? Yeah, he was, he was such an unbelievable help like to me doing everything. Like, to be honest, VRoom's like partly, it's half his, maybe more than <laughs> half, I don't know. <laughs> Because I was kind of teaching myself, I'd never written anything in C++ that was like, like that difficult. Like I said, I'd done a few tool, uh, really basic stuff like here and there, like, but nothing complicated. And v, uh, VRoom was like, maybe the first plugin I wrote. So I really jumped in at the deep end. Oh, uh, um, wow. Yeah, so like the idea behind VRoom is quite simple. I mean, for people who don't know, um, you just have a polygon and you pretend it's a window. So if you if you have a ray going hitting that polygon, you say, okay, what does it look like if it's a window? You've got a whole bunch of elements there. It's going to hit a wall on the inside at some point. So you have a HDR that maps to the the inside of a give yourself a fictitious cube interior. And you just follow the ray and just see where it would end up. And then you map a color to that point and you put a pane of glass in front of it. Um, and I had parameters for all of this stuff. And it was a hell of a learning experience. But um, the code is absolutely horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was not the quickest plugin. It, it did have nice results. It wasn't crazy slow. But um, yeah, you got that stuff like real time now in game engines so it's uh mm. yeah. yeah i mean one of the things that uh now we, when we're talking about vroom is i mean i still see a huge use for that sort of a plugin uh is it something that you would consider actually talking to lightweight digital about maybe sell it sell the source code to them oh they can have it i think i already gave it away to oh goodness me i forget his name but like i really they're better off just rewriting it because mm. yeah like maybe, i said maybe. you don't you don't want to take a code base that was someone's learning experience <laughs> on how to code like <laughs> le learning how to code and learning how the sdk works and learning how but still it's still like, a, i was kind of it, new to everything but it, uh, it's still a good starting point for anyone uh, i guess uh, if they want to uh, you know take the mantle and, and yeah. sort of they're welcome to take... have it i've already <laughs> given them um i gave them my other plugin chain uh, move yeah version two the one with instancing um yeah. and again that was a that was a nice little niche thing i think i always wanted to do tank treads and you could never mm. do it easily yeah or chains or stuff like that like it was just really difficult to do that stuff and um i don't know why like but when it comes to stuff like that, like, oh, how do I do a chain with different types of links and that the chain's got to fit exactly into a cog? And, like, mm. if your animation is really long, it's still got to fit into that cog absolutely perfectly. Like, once I get that idea in my head, I'm like, well, clearly I have to now make a plugin to do that. <laughs> like, and I just get the idea in my head and I just won't stop until I've done it so <laughs> but, but for things like that it's it's almost um like you, you really almost couldn't do it manually it's just so ridiculously complicated to build that mm. in a rigging system whereas to you know whereas to just simply like as you say just build a system that just works it all out for you uh is, mm. is so much better yeah and, yeah. and, and before and, be, and before you had uh that plugin I think that what you do, what you would do in Lightway, would use the morph trick. So you you have mm, essentially yes. uh, the whole tank thread 
being modeled out like you know like this and then um you do a morph so ev every link is sort of morphed into yeah. another position and then it jumps back to replace it then jumps yeah back exactly to and then so the, you end up with and then like looking we, like that exactly and then you could actually you could actually trick it to actually look like it has motion blur as well um yeah because the chain is essentially a repeating element over and over and over again mm. and each one replaces the next the previous one yeah. in, in the chain but i think like i remember looking at that tank uh, at that trick but like there was a reason i had a scenario where it wouldn't work mm. i can't remember if it was the dynamics or yeah probably something like that and like and uh, that also meant that like your 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 chain links like they all had to be homogeneous you couldn't have any difference between them yeah like at all obviously with the one i've got like you're using instancing so you can't have any differences there anyway but <laughs> no you can have uh, different sources to actually build up the same if you want to have yeah yeah certainly yeah, so one being also, more trashed or something like that you could you could use the instance id to modify the surfacing to be honest yeah yeah actually that's true you can so oh so yeah you, you would build a procedural system like if you want to do like worn edges or something you you, you know if mm. you look at an occlusion load mix that with a procedural and use the instance id to move the procedural about so that type of thing yeah ah that's true yeah, yeah. I, d I definitely remember there being something like lacking about the the, the morph trick and it was yeah, a trick. yeah 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 it's a good trick it, 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 it's a good trick but it's very outdated it, it, now it, it broke on a lot of situations and because of the motion blur thing i think that's the thing mm. that kind of killed it a little bit it was like a oh, it works but yeah special case yeah. type of thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That one was that was uh, that was a fun one. I did a, a, a couple of other little plugins here and there, but nothing, nothing yeah. insane. <laughs> By the way, uh, I do know that you developed a couple of tools for when you worked at, um, or I can't remember the, the studio now, but but you worked on uh, Iron Sky, and oh, you, yes. have, you have a couple yes. of tools that are named IS. Which stands for Iron Sky. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the true. noisy this channel the, the, and uh, I can't remember the other one. Um, oh, the camera yeah, remember, information, like, camera information. Yeah, thing. yeah. Because that was that was a couple of things that we we needed. Like, and I just needed those, so I was just like, okay, I'll just give them give them away afterwards. Like the camera one, it had like information stamped across the bottom. Hmm. It's just like an overlay. It's just a really simple thing, but you just couldn't do it at the at the time when we needed it for our shots. So I. Just uh, knock that that one up quite quickly. I also yeah. tried to do something. It was so, so, again my naivety showing, um, but uh, that was like the first the first real gig I had. I think was that movie. Um, yeah, and there was a bit where like there's the spaceship, like the main uh, protagonist spaceship is flying away, and it's got all these interceptor guns that like shoot down missiles and stuff mm, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I tried to write something that would like, like aim the gun correctly for any given missile to like fire a bullet to intercept it. it was so stupid. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, absolutely. Like, I don't know why someone didn't say to me like, "What are you doing? <laughs> Just well, do it manually." <laughs> well, to to be fair, we had a system. Uh... This was when we used Maya, actually. The visual effects guy, uh, or the effects guy, I should say. Uh, uh, he actually wanted us to have a spline for the bullet. So mm. he could actually see where that bullet would hit. So it was this yeah. long, very long, it could be a, a polygon that is just super extruded, you know. So that he can mm. know that if we and and, and then then that put us uh, because I was an animator back then. So w when we had to fire something, we ne we actually re really needed to know where where that that uh, bullet is going to hit, because that yeah. he will base um, he will base everything on a procedural system that he built in Maya. So that oh, okay, here's a bullet firing, and he is actually firing bullets or particles that would then yeah. spawn effects, you know. Uh, where they uh, when they hit some uh, surface or something like that, um, 
And so I assume he needed that to be a procedural system because I have done many procedural systems that did not need to be there, like that, yeah, the bullet yeah. firing, intercepting one. Like, I, I have learnt over the years that sometimes you just, just doing something manually is the best way to do it. You don't have to code everything all the time. Sometimes that's a mistake. I think like that is just my inclination. There was like I'm. I think of everything as it's like a puzzle, and it's like a puzzle that I want to solve. Like it's a problem I want to crack, so I just get it into my head. And if I've got no supervisor over me saying like, "Stop <laughs> wasting your time, you moron," then I'll just keep yeah. going. Like so, yeah. I've had to learn to constrain my own um, desires in that way. Yeah, I mean, plus as well, the sometimes there might just be like, "Well, why don't you just do this?" Which is using the native tools. Mm. And 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 then be like, oh yeah, actually, then that kind of makes this a little bit silly. <laughs> yeah, and you feel like a bit of a plum for like yeah, like like doing, I, I mean I, I, really I haven't done do anything like, like that, but the... you just like say make a make a null, put the null over the target, and then just point mm. the IK at the null. Yeah, that's an idea. <laughs> 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 or you just iterate, yeah, iterate, do stuff manually. Like, okay, yeah, it doesn't work there. You just spend spend some time, do some manual labor. It's fine. I also with those the the ships, I I wrote a system using relativity, I think, so that when those UFOs, they've all got like little tiny thrusters around the the UFOs, mm. so that when it rotated, for example, like the correct thrusters would fire. Mm -hmm. Um. Nice. I mean, it took ages to develop that, and it saved us minutes of labor, I'm sure, in animating. So it was a complete waste of time. But I yeah, did you, it anyway, because yeah, uh, no I, one told me to stop. Yeah, you have to be smart uh, about, you know, because mm. essentially this guy, because back then, um, uh, this guy that, that I'm talking about, we were doing World in Conflict, and we all our trailers were people firing bullets all our trailers yeah. and, and not just one it, it could be like uh, 10 people firing bullets and in that case th the only thing we needed to have is that sp spline thing attached to our weapon mm. so so we can aim where you know and that saved shit loads of time for him but but if it's mm. a one-off thing i mean come on yeah uh, it, it's it's uh yeah i think that's what experience teaches you is like when because especially when you're starting out as well you don't know how hard this stuff is how good you are at it as well like because you you think like well i know math so i've got the system i've got the tools here so i can make a procedural thing and then i won't have to do any of this manual labor and it's fine but then you just learn over time like when is it wise to do that when does it actually save you time or are you just doing that because it's a thing that you like to do what other software have you used along the way with lightwave 2d and 3d and i know we, we t touched on this you have used houdini right mm. but but is there any yes. other 3d <laughs> software that have used and also uh, compositing software maybe um compositing we use nuke um which is good mm -hmm. i think it's overpriced um yeah get fusion for what it is <laughs> but it is the better it is the best one so and there's there's no competition that's on equal footing with them so they can charge that much i mm. guess or well, what else are you gonna do fusion's always been like it's all right it's just it's it's not as like as much of a slick weasel as uh nuke is at all like nuke is it seems to be like the top level professional tool where everything is Every all those little things that we're talking about, like that you know go to frame thing, like mm. that they, that kind of shit is everywhere in Nuke. Whereas Fusion will occasionally slap you in the face. Like it's at yeah, a damn maybe. good price point. You can't really argue with that. But like it will, it will fuck up quite regularly. I think. But yeah, um, yeah we use Resolve for editing and the Fusion stuff in there. Um, yeah, it's there is some nice, there's some really nice stuff there. Like you can write these 
uh, Fuse plugins, I think they're yeah. called. I wrote one recently. Um, that shit is fast as well. That's really good because we have these... Um, I won't go into too much boring detail, but there's some stuff that we do because of the nature of our work there uh, that we need all the time. I can't remember if I mentioned this in the last interview, so sorry if I'm repeating myself. But there's some stuff that we repeat over and over and over and over and over again, and we have to reinvent the wheel again and again and again and again. So I just bit the bullet and I wrote a tool that can do this stuff for us. And now it's like you can just click and drag like footage onto a thing. It's in effect where it goes onto a bit of footage that just shablam does the thing that you need. And you've got controls on screen. And that's really, really nice as well. I mean, sure, you can do that kind of stuff in Nuke as well. Nuke, you could probably build it stuff out of like just normal nodes or whatever, but I've not gone too far into Nuke. I just use it for regular old compositing. But like, I like to, we use like Resolve as our like central hub for everything, and that's where everything ends up. So um, it's good to have tools in there to do <clears throat> some stuff in the edit because that's. The place yep. where you're going to be exporting yeah. stuff. I from. find, I and find that's where you can see stuff live. Fusion inside of Resolve weird. Yeah, it's like, getting I'm better. Quite liked, yeah, but I, 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 I like, I loved. I, I, I don't know Fusion hardly at all. But I've done the odd mm. bit, and I kind of am starting to grasp it. And um, and then you try and use it in Resolve, and you're like, what? This is not like using Fusion. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, it, it's it's different, but but. Uh... I would say that, I mean, creating timers and, and things like that, it's it's super easy and, and extremely efficient, I would say. If you want to have, let's say, a timer, you know, at the bottom right or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah. It's just handy to not have to go to, like, export your footage and open up another application exactly, yeah, and then yeah. find your footage and import yeah. it. Like, I've got the, the Fusion, open in Fusion thing, I've just got bound to a key. Because um, otherwise, it always opens up the the one, the topmost one, which yeah, is yeah, really yeah, stupid. Yeah. It doesn't open the one you've got selected, so I have to bound that to a, to a key. Mm. But that's really nice if it just opens up and you've got all your stuff. It's got more and more stable, which is good. It's like it, the progress on it is very slow, I find, but it is. They are making progress with it, and it's steadily yeah. getting more and more stable, more and more useful. It's just not as slick as as Nuke. It's all True. a little bit more awkward than Nuke, I find. Um, yeah, I mean, again, uh, we were comparing a compositing application with a video editor that actually has a built-in compositor on top. You know, it's, it's yeah. like app apples and oranges uh, almost. Uh. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't say that because, like, uh, Fusion standalone, like, was a direct competitor to Nuke, right? It's just yeah, a modal-based yeah. compositing application. So, you, the fact that it's in in Resolve doesn't really matter it's still the same application essentially um i do like it though it is it is good and just like i said having it there where you could just like hit one key and then you got your thing and it's right there that's really, yeah, I really mean, nice the, the, the color tools in fusion are crazy mm. i mean not the fusion well actually yeah resolve isn't resolve it? yeah the, 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 the color is yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm finding myself going oh i'm in a bit of a muddle i've made that many changes this <laughs> you, pull, but you can really pull stuff about can't you it's great yeah yeah if you're so into, yeah the resolve yeah. is great for like and the it's it's so inexpensive i i wish that mm. they would actually charge more and put more development on it so they speed that stuff up because i've i feel that the price point is actually too low because you've got this how much even is a studio license now? Uh, Resolve? I don't. I it's bought couple, mine it's in the hundreds, for, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I I bought mine for. I think it was four thousand Swedish, so four hundred UK or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's, it's in the it's in the hundreds. I know that much. Yeah. So you got that, and then the cost of Nuke, which is. Yeah. Way way above. There's there's nothing kind of in between. I think like you can go a bit closer if it gives you more money to but i, I think hire a uh, few more devs i think that uh, uh, uh the guys uh, black magic they actually yeah the, the thing that they make money on is their hardware mm. that's yeah. that's where so that's where the yeah. bread their bread and butter is um 
Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I'm surprised, you know, pretty much every time uh, I need to do the edit for a new episode of Lightwave Digest, for example, I get a prompt, mm. hey, here's a new version of, uh, here's an updated version of uh, yeah. Resolve. Yeah. So, so it's, <laughs> there it's, is. I mean, it, it, they, they do <sighs> at least a Resolve, the Resolve portion of, of Resolve is actually... Yeah. Uh, being updated a lot with the AI tools and and for audio and stuff like mm. that is mean amazing stuff. But yeah, yeah. Mo moving on yeah. a little bit there, uh, so we don't get too late. Um, That's okay. Um, yeah, I was gonna say the the other applications I use, I want to give a shout out to Cavalry. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's nope. 2D I've heard of it. I've heard of it. That's that's as much as I can I, say. <laughs> these, these guys like. What is it? What is I, it? It, it's a 2D, it's 2D, app, 2D animation application. It's kind of like what After Effects should be. The problem, uh -huh. like, After Effects is nice, but it's like, it's so old now, I find. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where it's a jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Because it's, it's an editor as well as <clears throat> a 2D animation thing. And it's just, it's for me. I know lots of people love After Effects. Fine, go for your life. But it's layers mm. and the controls for things are all in fucking weird places as far as I can see. There's no consistency in the design. Um, whereas Cavalry is a thing they built from the ground up. And it is obviously a direct competitor to After Effects. And it's, oh, it's designed to do motion graphics, but it's designed to do it sort of procedurally ish and i think behind the scenes it's kind of nodal based at the moment and you can, can you can hook up parameters to other parameters but it's got a consistent interface as well which is nice um it's still being uh, developed and i've used it on a few projects i think and when i kind of got used to used to it it was such a it felt like a breath of fresh air to use so I really want to use it in, in our 2D projects in the future to make stuff. And it feels to me like it's one of those things that once once you get over the learning curve of it, it's like the productivity is going to go whoosh. Yeah, like, of course. Because After yeah. Effects, everything is manual. Uh, you can kind of script. You can kind of do stuff. You can... But like I think we wrote one of those... In fact, the, the tool that I, I was speaking about earlier, the, the fuse I wrote for uh, Resolve for one of our effects, one of my other colleagues tried to write in After Effects. And it's, it wasn't a complicated thing. It's basically just sort of a, a circle with a line pointing to a thing and another circle and some other shapes um, that were animated. And like the way you had to build it was all really stupid because you had to build it all with bezier curves or something like that and it was so slow it was abominably slow so you could build these tools in after effects but like all of their solutions to everything it was sort of a hacky shitty job that was just a bit shit and impractical in the end because it was just <laughs> too slow to use so it just feels like to me, like After Effects is so full of like old code, mm, yeah, yeah. and it's built on a foundation of just stuff that's just so out of date now that like I would love, I would love to see Cavalry take some ground against them because they it really deserves it as well. It's mm. it's a really well designed, strong application that's um, like for anyone if if people out there do like motion graphics for a living then yeah learn that it'll probably make you more productive i would love to love to use it but i spend half my time doing pipeline stuff nowadays <laughs> so i i keep occasionally going back to it and then i'll be like okay i gotta relearn it again um i keep getting a little bit further each time i'm trying to think what other applications we use actually on a day-to-day -day basis because i most mostly use those standard ones like houdini nuke um got a few like we've got a synthetic ai voiceover generator um yeah i feel sorry for the people in the voiceover industry 
I feel sorry for people in our industry as well. <laughs> <Filter>. <laughs> yeah. With Sora. I, I saw that the, the Sora stuff and I was like, okay, it's been a good run, kind of. <laughs> so now this is about the community, uh, a lightweight community. Mm -hmm. So what do you think will help the, the community to be, to be and stay positive, constructive, engaging mm -hmm. and energetic? What, what, what do you think needs to be, to happen there? Growth, <laughs> new blood, new blood. Cause okay. at the moment, mm. I th yeah, I, th I think it's, and, and I don't necessarily know how to do it. Like I said, I don't, and it's an unenviable task, but, um, basically cause we've been using lightweight for such a long time and the community was like this and it's slowly, slowly gone down to this without too much injection of, of new new blood into it mm. um but that's really tough to do because of that big blender shaped elephant in the room <laughs> mm. because the barrier for, the barrier for entry for that is just so much lower yep and yeah it's got a lot of features <laughs> and it's hard to tell someone especially like people who are just starting out it's such an intangible thing saying like, yeah, but you might be faster in light wave because of some ethereal thing that I can't quite explain that may be just my muscle memory. And I don't know, Yeah, yeah. but you'll have sure. to spend a whole bunch of money to find that out. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think like the, in or getting light wave used again in, in a, in a project of, notoriety would be good i think because you don't have to have people always say like start talking about babylon 5 again or <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it's not really relevant anymore is it uh, mm -hmm. no no because like you know we're all old enough now that people have like they don't know what babylon 5 is even if they are nerds they've <laughs> never seen it <laughs> Because it's yeah. ancient. And even like if they us. have seen it, they'll be like, I don't get it. And say, like, well, because it's a bit like Tron. Um, yeah. Tron <laughs> broke the mold. Babylon 5 broke the mold. But mm, yeah. you're like, watch it and go, well, this is a bit crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you don't understand how much money they didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because anybody that knows like goes but, no but no but this this you've got to understand you've got mm. to understand and they're like oh, okay get away from us weirdo um it, yeah. you know retrospectively it looks a bit crap um it was super groundbreaking it was amazing at the time and like for guys yeah. like us we were all sitting there going what yeah, is this yeah. magic i must learn yes. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's amazing stuff but, but yeah, if can't... it could be used on some like high profile projects, then mm. you would that's like free marketing and then you get people interested that way. Yeah. Maybe not that I'm a marketing expert, but like Is there anything course. we didn't ask you that you would like to talk about? Or is there anything we talked about that you would want to expand on? Because I feel like yeah, we talked about quite a bit of stuff in in this and and in the previous mm -hmm. yeah. the previous thing. Sorry, I'm a bit tired now. So yeah, like, sorry. I mean, yeah. running out of batteries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> another feeling. Yeah, uh, I, I don't, I don't believe so. No. Hmm? Yeah, the thing I just always want to hammer on is just get Lightwave into existing pipelines. Yeah. Um, again, I'm sure the devs have already thought of this, but yeah. it's... Um, I, I, but I that, think... that's my my thing as well because that's what I'm trying to do. And at the moment, like, yeah, give me the Linux version, Eesh, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, they are good. Uh, I think what they showed with the light, uh, the the Unreal Bridge is a good sign that they actually want to have, mm. like, we communicate with other applications as as good as possible. When I say like fit into pipelines, it, it doesn't necessarily have to communicate directly with other other tools. Although, like, having like um, uh, an importer for Houdini would be fantastic, but that's really more after side effects, I suppose. Um, but it's having, having the, 
having the way it deals with like where well, you got the the Python API now is very very good as far as I'm aware. I, I it was sort of came up as I was sort of leaving Lightwave, I suppose, so I never got to use it in in anger too much. But from what I see, it's very very capable. Mm -hmm. So that fills a a big gap that it had before, where you just couldn't do a lot of stuff. But now you can seemingly do pretty much anything. Um. I'd just have it be um, nice and easily configurable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's like that's a that's good. It. That's a good point, actually. And last but not yeah. least, and I think you mentioned a bunch of names on this uh, in the last episode. But who would you want to see on this podcast? Dick Van Dyke. There you go. Yeah, Dick Van Dyke. Dyke. Yeah, sorted. He got Lee Stringer as well. He did. Um, I worked with him on Iron Sky, and he did. Yeah. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. Lee Stringer. He yeah. did some stuff on Voyager, so I'm sure he's mm. got a few stories to tell. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been fantastic. Hopefully, we haven't just talked over you the entire time. <laughs> We're gonna take that all no. out and make it look like you talk loads. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, uh, it's been a good conversation. I really do like talking to you guys. Thank you all for watching and listening to this month's episode. Be sure to tune in next time so that you don't miss out on all the goodies we've got for you. In the meantime, if you have any news stories you'd like us to know about, you can reach us in the comment section or send an email to lightwavedigest at gmail.com with the word news in the subject line. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, subscribe, share and comment. Your engagement is really important to us, so thanks in advance for your support. So until next month, always light the wave.